Hello humans, this is Dave Herman, alias Daz the Artist, and thanks for tuning in. I'm going to start a video of part three of me working on the uh, two human bacon hunters. So these are creations by a type three civilization in my imagination. They're looking for humans to make bacon out of. <laughs> they've come to the earth and uh, they made humans and now they're going to eat humans <laughs> this is a science fiction humorous picture but you can see the one on the right the creature his face in helmet and everything is like a totem of three masks at the top there's a one that looks almost like a western man with pearls like he might be uh, part of a Hawaiian tiki thing as it gets down into a shape that's kind of uh, reptilian monkey looking into the monkey one below and it's also like a totem pole so maybe humans at some point saw these and got the idea for totem poles then the one on the left is another type of a autonomous bot creation that we're going to develop up and then the hand wrapping around it could be of the bot on the left in a very peculiar bot position holding like a rock or it could be the one on the right arm but uh, it doesn't matter to me. I just put it there to make it confusing in that position. So we're going to start working on that hand. And, you know, we're going to bring that way up. So this is actually 36 by 36 inches at 300 dpi at the actual size for output. So it will scale down to everything from 12 by 12 on up to 36 by 36 square in an art station store. And let's go over to the hand here. Let's get that all on the screen at once to work on. Okay. So I've got a lot of crude shapes that I threw down there to get it started, but we're going to start fixing that up uh, as best as we can and shaping it and working on it and refining it and so on. So we'll go to Eraser first in the Designer Persona part of Affinity Designer and take out that line at the bottom with some erasing. And, yeah, kind of just shape that a little bit. I want to square it off. So I'm going to erase down there. I'm going to come up a little bit. And I'm going to redraw with the brush in black the end of that so kind of gonna up the opacity of my brush up the flow so you see upper left at the top and let's just kind of make a, an ending to that so like that kind of an oblong kind of a shape and I think I'm going to bring up the opacity even more to 100, but I'll keep the flow at 63. And we will draw in kind of the ending there. Okay. We're going to refine all these fingers and stuff. So let's see. I go to a white, a gray, and I'm going to come down these areas with some gray and tighten up these lines that show the separation and partition between the um, parts. They're just doing some gray work there and uh, you know these textures and things I kind of like it the way I do it it's just all kinds of uh, hodgepodge kind of interesting graphics uh, done to look like a charcoal painting, charcoal illustration. 
you know, because it's just black and white and gray. So I, if you watch part one of this, it shows me actually making uh, a texture over the paper, the imaginary paper that I'm working on here in cyberspace. And then I, over that texture, I do my initial sketch. Uh, and then how I go from there. And then there's parts two and now part three. So these are all done um, and presented unedited. So as you're watching me now, uh, you know, this is the beginning of this. By the time you get to the end, there'll be some major changes. But if I made a mistake, I just show you how I correct my mistake. I don't, my mistake. I don't stop this video and uh, edit it past it or anything. I like to show everything that goes into the creation of one of my illustrations. Now the reason I do that for free and don't charge or anything like that to try and make money on these is I just want exposure as an artist and someday I hope that my artwork sells and brings me opportunity to do little projects. I've only been lucky so far to get one nice little project to do for somebody that was totally a creative thing and it required me working in vector graphics at like giant resolution and then shrinking it down to scale the end product the uh, person that hired me never let me see <laughs> but I was paid and uh, that was a good thing they were a good client but I never got to see the final. And I don't, I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if the person had a meltdown or what. People are funny in the Northwest where I live. Although the entire earth has become funny. If you turn on the news, funny is like an understatement for insane. So I bury myself in my art. That's where I find my solace, my contentment. You know, I have ever since I've been a small child. So I've been an artist. And if you watch my videos, I kind of go over my history just briefly. But uh, always was an artist. That's a fact. And then just play around in different things and... How they come out is how they come out, you know? I still like to do my own thing thinking that, you know, after a lifetime goes by, at some point, there'll be a synchronicity where my peculiar way of creating will be in demand, desired, sought after enough for me to, at that point, make a living. From my art and there's got to be some synchronicity with uh, my skills what the public seeks and so on but I don't cater to like I could draw anything digitally photorealistic uh, puppets whatever people want instead I pursue my own because I want it to be my own based on a particular set of strategies and ideologies and things uh, about science that I have, things about civilizations that came before us, thoughts, you know. Um, some, some are pretty hard-pressed. You know, I, I really feel that there were more advanced civilizations than us that once inhabited the Earth. But, and this is a big but, because we don't see electronics and stuff like that doesn't mean they weren't more advanced you know the stone builders and the way they constructed ancient Egypt and ancient Pumapunku and Ayante Tambo and Angkor Wat and all those civilizations you see on ancient aliens and the YouTube channels and so on where they expose um, evidence that prove they could only have made these things with advanced tools advanced or more advanced than what we have 
um, when aerospace engineers look at it and go, the uh, the archaeological record doesn't record any of these tools. In other words, they were uh, they can they can look at the marks and tell for sure what it takes to make that mark, but if that mark has never appeared in anything until uh, except what we're finding. In other words, it's not in our archaeological record of our civilization that we live in, which we consider to be advanced. And yet we can't find their tools. The whole thing is a giant mystery. That kind of a mystery really appeals to me because I look at their videos and they show me saw marks. They show me cut edges. They show me things in granite that are only an eighth of an inch wide and their cut goes in, you know, four feet into it. So it had to be a circular saw. If the rock is split, they find one split and they can find the curve on the profile of the rock, which some of them have, they suggest 65 feet in diameter when you work the circumference out backwards. And that's a pretty easy mathematical thing to do. Um, so they know they have the tools. And just they're, they were more in tune with, more harmonious in the way that they lived with nature. They built things to withstand earthquakes. They built water systems that um, did not pollute, but they did deteriorate over time because minerals corrupted them uh, or droughts made them inadequate to take care of the people or things happened and these civilizations became extinct or they left the earth, but we don't know. There's been approximately five or six extinctions before us. They are saying we live in the sixth, but uh, I couldn't tell you for sure, because when we're talking about things that are extinct, the mere fact that you say that is extinct and doesn't exist anymore also conjures up the fact that, well, we can't find enough evidence of how they live either. So it's an enigma. And so what I'm getting at is when I draw something like this, where you see me playing with these things and trying to create my original positive, negative, uh, manipulations of the charcoal and stuff in cyberspace where I'm trying to simulate a 3D creation that's never been seen before. Uh, I kind of go by my own little gut feelings and sometimes my own scientific studies as to why I'm doing these things. But the explanations, uh, you know, if you bought a piece and you wanted to know, I'd, I'd reveal a little bit. Nothing's really, you know, crazy or anything. It's just based on science. Now, the way I put these together and stuff, of course, it's my own way. Because I want that to look semi-organic. I want it to be high-tech. I want it to be something using materials in a different way than we do. So even though I suggest machinery and I just contours of many facets with many angles with many ports for ejecting heat and for wires and cables to be going through them or uh, hinges they're all things that you know these are doable and they would look very strange to us and i want them to look strange to us that's the thing i don't want us to have like a frame of reference, I mean, other than it's a finger, 
and it's a mechanical finger. It's not the way we earth people would make that finger. Okay, so it might use a high carbon base or silicon base materials based on uh, application and maneuverability and heat sensitivity. Uh, could it work in a radiation belt? That kind of stuff. So they're not meant to look just like friendly things. They're meant to be practical tools and also be so otherworldly as to inspire a little bit of fear in us or a little bit of curiosity in us because we just don't understand how you would make this and so it's rather than say uh, they're just poor designs and the guy doesn't know what he's talking about I would I would encourage you to just open your mind because I have an inkling an inkling based on what I've seen that if anything ever came here from a very far distance away and had to pass through all the radiation was able to travel for a long time like light years <clears throat> vast distance over light years uh, <clears throat> those period those materials must withstand radiation they would not be humans they would not be even organic life forms they would be their bots to come here to terraform the earth or to perform tasks because of the radiation that they pass through once you're in space the potential for complete destruction of the ship going through asteroid fields things like that and those things are why these creatures would look like they do they might want them to be terrifying on one hand so that nobody's going to attack it they may have built into the dna of the creature a fear to get near it and so on but the ability to form to perform tasks like our fingers do and pick up things and store things and all that good stuff yet do it in a in a radiation belt like say the ship broke down and they're traversing the heavens well if it has to go outside the ship why should it have a spacesuit? You know, I mean, a spacesuit, we use a spacesuit to have oxygen fed to the astronaut, let them have evacuation if they need to go to the bathroom, and protect them from radiation. But these kind of creatures, they wouldn't need to be protected from radiation. Uh, the bathroom is not an issue, nor is. Um, eating so they may need to apply a lubrication to their joints they may need to pour fluids into them to grease the machinery but they shouldn't have to do any of that prep they should be able to just jump out and go to work and so that's why I make these now it could be fascinating to them what they look like. It uh, may not look anything like the species that creates them. However, you know, they're immortal. They're basically immortal. A type 3 civilization has figured out uh, how to use the energy of its star and perhaps how to be immortal. And may have in the course of becoming immortal uh, created a super advanced civilization that outlived them 
And at some point, these are, while they never looked like their makers, um, are self-aware machinery. So they repair themselves, and they make more of themselves, and they understand what the makers have revealed to them, whatever that may be in their memory banks, their drives, and whatever it is more advanced than a drive, you know, an organic. Uh, so we have been able to store DNA inside a hard drive. And if we can do that, who knows what, you can't even fathom what another civilization may possibly do because it's only, you're only looking at that from our perspective. And I like to, you know, maybe these things have been used and they're slightly dented or they have cracks in them or stuff is wrong or, you know. The textures are weird. And, uh, I like to have that anomaly, uh, you know, just the what is going on kind of thing, you know. Edit, undo, edit, undo. Edit, undo. Edit, undo. I got the opacity too high. Because it's making almost a solid mark, and we don't want solid, we want it textured. Gonna probably get it off of hardness a little. And let's see, come down there. See, so now it's a little bit opaque. I can see through it. Making a ridge. These hinges don't have to work the way we're used to. They can be uh, equatorial mounts, or as it moves, one that closes, one opens. Uh, could be something completely different and foreign to our frame of reference. And so that's what I intend to make when I draw these things, just so that you know. And at the same time, take some, same time, take some artistic license just to make them look like cool looking art objects. And, uh, you know, I'm just freestyling away. And uh, concealing a lot of these black lines. So there's like a shape there that, you know, can bring that together. And it's, it's getting a feel and, and trying to set up your tools, too, digitally. Very complicated applications can be done with these. You know, you want it lighter, you want it darker, you want it textured. There's so much. And because you don't want to jump back every two seconds from all these applications, you want to learn how to paint like like the effect you can conjure up. That's what I do. I want it to be where I just keep paint painting like I'm charcoal drawing. And when I would charcoal draw, I'm either adding charcoal, I'm either taking a kneaded gummy eraser and erasing or taking a Q-tip and smearing, or one of those rubber tips that you put on the end of a piece of plastic. It's a triangular kind of nib to smear charcoal or chalk. And I'm thinking about all that stuff while I'm drawing. Same way like if I was tattooing and I'm creating effect, I'm also thinking about making my machine run properly. And uh, so this thumbnail kind of thing here I'm also thinking is got to be on top the rotation of this part has got to be just right for a strangeness I'm filling in some of this black here making a little more background
it's not a fast process the way I work when I actually get down and thinking, thinking, thinking. And uh, sometimes I've changed my mind so radically that I really got to adapt it. So like here I'm thinking I'm going to put more of a torque in that and I'm going to uh, lay down some airbrush background. texture through there. Come back and work these backgrounds later. But the contrast between that and the object. Now notice I haven't saved because if I don't like this I'll just start over. But I'm, I'm getting somewhere where I want to make a save and then look at this from far away. So bear with me. Okay, so now we start to curve this into the, the negative space. It's part of the optical illusions. This is just a little too heavy. And I take that down even more so. And just softly come down there. Like, very soft. Bring it up. I'm trying to heal, hide that crack. And coming across here. Now I'm getting some lift as I work my way down. There we go. And we're going to hide some of this crack up at the top. On both sides, we're going to come down. And uh, stitch across there. Some kind of weird weirdness. Some black. So it's not a speedy process by any means. No. And uh, it's it's just a kind of a until I get into like a really deep groove at night where I'm just flowing. Where I just kind of go whoosh 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 whoosh. Oh yeah, that looks cool. <laughs> Takes me a while to animate myself. Already. Sometimes it happens very quickly, but tonight it's not. Tonight I'm kind of lagging. People wanted ink. They didn't show up for tattoos. They didn't call back. And typically you go through some of these clients that just or abusive. So today was an experience like that with some client and I don't pay no attention. I just went about my day. Took a nap, went shopping, worked out, did all kinds of stuff, but at some point you run out of momentum, you take a nap, which I did, so I could stay up and draw. See, now it's getting that organic, mechanical flow that I want. And I'm able to see what I want to achieve. So now we're going to hit save, and I'm going to pan back so this makes sense. So first we hit save. Then I'm going to display this at actual. Let me show you how big actual size is. Gigantic. Kabam. That is, if this drawing was output at 36 by 36 inches at 300 dpi. But if I say fit on screen, zoom to fit, now you can see how that thumb, see, it's, it's developing weird contours, but the shading and everything starts to make sense. Okay, when it's really gigantic, it's hard to figure that out what I'm doing. But because I've done it before, and I like doing it, you know, I kind of have a sense about it. But there, see, it's starting to have like a gloss and a thickness. You can kind of feel the mass. You can kind of feel those grooves. You can kind of feel uh, parts might be hinged and plated and 
it's just something made to withstand outer space and yet be super articulate to pick up a pebble, let's say. I hope all that makes sense because I'm trying to entertain you at the same time. <laughs> and we're only 30 minutes into it, so, okay, so it's cool. But this is what it really takes me to draw. Now, I could just say you're in a 3D program, which I don't work in any 3D programs. I've watched people work in them, and you, you bring up your clay, you make a model, and then you skin that model. I'm not skinning anything. I'm drawing in 3D space and defying conventional rules. So say I want to put a hinge on a part. Let's just, let's articulate some of this right now. So we're on the side of the thumb towards the right, uh, near the, near the, fa near the face. You probably, I don't know if my cursor is showing up or you can just follow me sketching. And I'm going to make it almost like a door. We're going to define that like a door. So we're going to uh, change opacity constantly and flow constantly and stuff to be darker or lighter. Okay, so let me follow these contours. Change my brush size. Which I'm using my uh, hmm, Express Key Remote. Express Key Remote Tool. There we go. Now I'm coming down this ridge. This is kind of a doorway to something. I'm going to go on the outside edge, so put a little highlight there so you can kind of see this part. And some articulations. But I'm trying to keep it otherworldly. So if you see a pattern emerge, it's not going to be like our number one or the letter A or a diamond or something like that. It's going to be a pattern that I'm creating. Um, that be foreign to us. And so when we look at it, we go, oh, I don't know what that is. What's he drawing? However, this would be, and this by no means is actually what it would look like. It's to create that sense, that feeling that you're unfamiliar with what you're looking at. And it's going to create shock when we see these things. It's going to be unnerving, unnerving to realize that uh, I mean we're almost going to know when we see these things that we are probably not even as evolved as a dog is to us we to the makers and that's just conjecture and theory so don't get freaky on me. I'm just making stuff up as I go. But if I'm doing sci-fi, I don't want mine to be same, same, same old, same old. You know, like Star Wars or something like that. No. Star Wars doesn't really represent the future. You know, there's series that were way more complicated, like Farscape or um, Farscape's a very good one, even though it had puppets and it, the pilot was on an organic spaceship, you know, or uh, Lex, the Lex was on an organic spaceship. So, you know, it was a dragonfly shaped spaceship, the most powerful spaceship in the galaxy. So this kind of things that were years and years ago that you've probably not watched if you're a newborn millennial or I'm an older guy, I recommend looking up the Lex, L-E-X-X. -X. It's all over YouTube, but you don't know the name, so it would never come up. Or Farscape, you can watch the entire 50, or let's see, it's probably about 50, 60, maybe even 80 
episodes. I don't remember. I've watched the entire series. And uh, you will see how the future came and went. It was way more advanced than the idea of Starbuck, or Star Wars. Way more. And still, it was too much for people. You know, spaceships that needed to eat stars. It's just, but that's how they would get fuel, you know, except the spaceship could talk, you know, spaceship could say, I need to eat a star, Stan. Uh, we can't comprehend that. And the fact that they're very old and they came and went, it's been dumbed down a lot since then. You know, when you think of a Tesla car, a Tesla car is pretty cool, but it's just working on an electric battery. It's not like taking oxygen or hydrogen out of the atmosphere and turning it into fuel in a completely like photosynthetic way that works with the environment. Let's say, it, you know, produced oxygen and took carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere like in photosynthesis. It's not an organic thing that's doing that. It's just a machine. We made a battery. It plugs up the electricity. We made the electricity. But it's not very advanced. They're not super tools. They, they do, you know, they're now starting to make a profit and stuff like that, but... Uh, It could be the forerunner of some type of thing that somebody's going to have an epiphany about. But right now, that and all the other things using lithium batteries are using batteries. Batteries have weight. Batteries are stationary objects. Batteries are doing what batteries do. And they're not, you know, friendly. <laughs> their components aren't environmentally friendly at all. They're just as evil as gas. Fossil fuel, but fossil fuel, I'm sure it could be processed where it's not evil. Because what is it is decayed jungles and forests are what make oil. And from oil they get gas. And, and that could be processed in such a way where it went back into the earth, it would be environmentally friendly. But we aren't that civilization. We do not have those skills. Now, there's ways to do that. I am I sure of it. Because the fact that I don't see the detrimental effects of past civilizations you know, other than a rock quarry has tons of rocks that were cracked and never used, that doesn't hurt anything. So, therein lies the rub, you know. Be just because we can't find evidence doesn't mean that they weren't more advanced. It means that the evidence melts back into the earth in an environmentally friendly way. And uh, you may not agree at all with what I'm saying. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm proposing hypothesis as I draw that what you can't find may be designed to not be found. Not because they want to stay hidden, but because they were so good at utilizing resources that it, it had a very, very minimal effect. You know, like rock quarries aren't organic things. You know, they're not growing new rocks the next day. Once you chop them out of there, they're chopped out, and good luck. You go to another quarry when you've exploited, uh, you know, marble quarry or granite quarry or uh, limestone or diorite or whatever material they're using. But stone is just there, you know. It rises up out of the earth. 
it's a gift. So you chop it up and you use it. And it's forever. It's very hard to carbon date a building that you made out of rock because those rocks are millions and millions and millions of years old. But if you go to the quarry, you may be able to discern from lichen growing on it or a tool there what time frame it was made in or when it appeared on the earth according to the mythology and the stories and the written languages of the people indigenous to the areas where we discover these things. On the other hand, things that we don't discover, things that disappeared, it disappeared because maybe they were so cool they, they thought about that. They just said, well, hey, you know, this is going to wear out in 15 years and it's not going to be ugly. It's just going to be gone. It's not going to be bad. It's just going to be gone. And, you know, the shelf life. Maybe we just want to we're going to farm here, but we can't farm here forever because the soil will become depleted. You know, we're not going to be, able, we can rotate it by planting nitrogen rich plants one year and then a different type of plant one year and so on like they do in farming. But eventually the soil has to be replaced. So if you make man-made man gardens, terraced gardens, where you can drag the soil up there, it's a lot of work, you know. And the gardens you look at at uh, Machu Picchu, there's hundreds and hundreds of terraced gardens, 12 feet tall, immense amount of work. So to fill those with soil over time, you would need to create a most extremely clever way of rain falling and bringing the soil down. Well, we don't see evidence of that because it doesn't drip over the terraces into the next one. Now, a clever way to do that would be conceal it so it dropped down into the rainwater and the soil uh, moved down to the top layer there's concealed holes and things. It fills up a trench. That trench bulges over down into the next layer and so on. They were that kind of a people. They, I don't, it's not that advanced in the ones we find. But there are areas, I'm sure, in Anchor Wat and places like that where they did do those things because they had moats. And those moats gathered water for rice paddies and fields. And, uh, and the reason I'm bringing all this up, because I'm creating these completely bizarre-looking reptilian uh, hinged apparatus, and then some of it just is overlapping uh, scales of metal or something like that, is to... I bring it up to remind you that should we ever, ever, ever in our lifetimes, I'll probably be dead before you guys have the advantage to see, but should we ever encounter something that's coming here for whatever reason from somewhere else, or is here and surfaces for an agenda, it's very important to train your mind not to be fixated on the way we perceive three-dimensional space. Because time and space, what they call space-time, is not a solid. <laughs> and uh, can be manipulated. There's no doubt about it. And there are things going through outer space that completely boggle our minds. So, here's something to ponder for thought, right? So, if you're an advanced civilization, and you want something that's going to be able to go through outer space, let me say this, I'm beginning to like this. And you want that spaceship to be impervious to meteors, radiation, 
being smashed into by asteroids, comets, then the best thing to do is find a very large one or a chunk of a moon if you have the capabilities to do the machining that we see and you take a chunk of that off because that is what's out in outer space and that is what's impervious or near impervious to encounters with space objects and you would hollow that out say like our moon for instance <laughs> you would take something that big you would hollow it out and put all your gear inside there because then when meteors hit it and stuff like that it doesn't break it you would not keep trying to manufacture stuff from the stuff on your planet into a shape you would take something that exists you would hollow it out that's the the advanced qualities of a type 3 civilization they would they would just use what's there like the civilizations use these rocks on the earth and they said okay we're going to shape them this way and they fit together this way like a tetris puzzle no two are alike and we understand the forces we understand how many g's uh the earth pulls from the center to the top surface we understand uh earth an earthquake takes place and there's a the magma shifts underneath and the crust and so on and they understand those underlying forces maybe better than we did and so they just say well we're going to use the natural material and we're going to construct now it's one thing to know that it's one thing to say this is what i want you to do crew it's another thing to have the machinery and tools to do that and so when we find these things and we say man that statue everything in the face of that that pharaoh from left to right both eyes both nostrils both eyebrows both cheeks are 100 percent symmetrical and it's carved in solid granite it's smooth to mirror reflective finishes and we look at that and we go we have never made one <laughs> with our civilization we have no idea how to get there but reverse engineering it astrophysicists and, and aeronautical engineers and mechanical and chemical engineers and software engineers they look at it all and they go yeah man like the tools that made this we have yet to invent and that's where you begin to say well we're not going to be able to have an intelligent discussion about this for a long time so we might as well just tell the public that they made that with rocks and they pounded on it with rocks until they shaped something as beautiful as they created which is just ludicrous common sense without even doing an experiment common sense tells you that stones are measured on a hardness scale from zero to ten say one to ten if a stone falls on that hardness scale number seven and whatever that material is quartz granite diorite uh, basalt from a volcano if it takes a stone if a stone is number seven that means it can only be shaped by stones higher up on the scale whatever is number eight whatever is number nine whatever is number ten and in most cases that means diamonds now to use diamonds as tools you've really got to ponder this stuff because this is mind-boggling first of all you got to know what a diamond is and they're in the ground and you would not be sitting around as a primitive person in a cave still trying to figure out fire and stuff or basic gardening you haven't genet genetically modified any plants like the uh, 
advanced civilizations did. They created avocados or created dates or created pomegranates. You know, those things didn't just grow that way. They were nurtured. They were nurtured. And, and they're nutritious. And they're the best things we can eat for our health. And the less manufactured foods, like sugars and powders and things that we come up with, uh, it's, it's better for you to eat these things that grow naturally, that were made by advanced civilizations to really make a human body replenish itself. And when we look at that stuff and we go, oh, well, from the air, that arena, if you really go up high enough, it's in the shape of an avocado. Now, the human would never see that with a hot air balloon, but somebody did. Somebody knew what they were making in the earth because we just discovered that now with flight. You know, we could not go up into the air other than, let's say, hypothetically, in a hot air balloon, if any civilizations had them. When you go back to the Wright brothers, like eight, late 1800s, and say a little bit before that, there were no airplanes. There was nothing. Yet we find things made in the earth that require, um, you know, they're a line nine miles long doesn't deviate. It's straight across a terrain that may go up to 4,000 feet, down to zero, back up to 4,000 feet, around a curve, through a river. And these are the Nazca lines. So that's what's amazing about them is People say, oh, they just made them. They didn't, weren't made to be seen from the air. Well, okay, let's assume that. How did they keep it straight for nine miles? You know, take the city you live in and imagine driving nine miles away. You know that when you drive through the road, you go up, down, left, right, through all kinds of strangeness. If you had to draw a line in the ground with a piece of chalk nine miles long, what it would take to go over those surfaces, and yet how would you keep it straight? How would you keep it straight like you lined up the first point to the last point? How would you do that? There's numerous ways you can think about that, but actually doing it, that's a whole nother trick. So, again, what I'm getting at is other civilizations prior to us had different ways of solving problems. But most of the ways they solved problems were not to be uh, disrespectful to the earth. They respected the planet. They plundered it. They took all the raw materials out, that's for sure. But we don't find, uh, when they actually plunder the stone, plunder, you know, the gold, silver, copper, raw materials, we don't find that they used acids, or we don't find that they used, you know, bleaches, or we don't find that they used toxic materials. They just got it out of there. And they must have had super cool ways of applying heat and just extracting that stuff, you know. They just, in mass, warmed up an area and it ran out and they took it. There's areas that have been chipped and worked and, you know. But there's other areas where it's just gone. It's just gone. Michigan was plundered like crazy for copper you know the hypothesis is the vikings uh age or when the bronze age came and they needed copper and they needed tin and they needed raw materials the copper came from michigan because they know where the mines are copper mines and they can calculate the amount of tonnage that has been removed 
and relocated, and it's astronomical. <laughs> so you didn't have like a transport by air. You didn't have like a B-52 bomber. You could load it up with copper and move it. You had to take this across the water in some type of a ship, whether it was a Viking longboat with the dragon heads or, you know, Hawaiian uh, special boats or Phoenicians or the Greeks. These are enigmas that uh, have unanswered questions because they didn't do so much damage. You know, when we do something, we leave a trail that shows how destructive we are. When we carve down a mountain and steal all the marble, you know, it shows us going uh, in a circular path down or a rectangular path down and how we've taken everything away. And if we use chemicals, there are traces of the chemicals and you can tell the machines from the shapes. And the machines are there, of course, so if a machine breaks, we just leave it there because it's, maybe it took a long time to get it to there. And if it weighs tons, you know, it's very hard to move them. So people just say it's not cost-wise. We're just going to leave it. And uh, we leave our clues our way. They left very little clues to their advanced civilizations. The wonders are there. The combinations are there, the materials, the stonework is there, the just megaton stones. They could be totally look like humans, but we they use something that we don't know. And that is wherein the mystery lies. Hence, I am making up something now that we have no idea how this puts together, but it looks like this. That's what I'm getting at. So now I'm going to go into my brushes, and I'm going to go to pens. So we're approaching the hour working. Uh, basic, sorry. And these solid lines of different dimension. And you, you can use them, and you can change whether they're solid or not by changing your flow and all that stuff. Capacity, flow, hardness. And then work them into these crevices like I'm doing. See that? So that would be like taking a hard piece of fine charcoal and snapping it and using that in my charcoal drawing full strength and pressing it in between where I've used a kneaded gum eraser and a smudge stick. and So I think of the techniques that I would do traditionally and then look for the tool digitally. And that's my thought process and it really is an important thought process to have when you get into digital art because I'm self-taught and I could be totally wrong but that was my first epiphany. There's other things I do. But realizing that, well, if I just find the tool that I that, and think about me drawing traditionally, what was I doing? Was I rubbing it off with an eraser? Was I using a hard charcoal? Was I using a soft vine charcoal? Was I smudging with a q-tip? Was I using a rubber stick? Was I using 100 pounds, you know, cloth paper? Was I using a, a cardboard or Strathmore? Or what was I doing? And what was the effect? And I did it that way because... And then I think of how to do that digitally. It isn't just that I'm drawing. I do think about those things. 
And this, you know, then when I see something, you see how I'm slowly shaping and turning and creating. And, you know, it may not be the best. You're going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. You know, in the end, I, I do a lot of bizarre optical illusions. But I'm sort of working out the mechanics of this hand in the thumb. I wanted to get that all down in my brain before I attack the fingers and work it out. So, there we go. Things I do alone as an artist. Happy artist. And I am. I've achieved a lot now. Got a lot going on with uh, different tattoos from time to time. Um, do a little part-time work in a butcher shop so I can learn about meat, what meat looks like, <laughs> work meat into my art. Uh, I study things, and I study them firsthand. I can ask people questions, but they're not going to answer me. So I just go and I do it. And then when someone sees it in my art, they say, well, how did you figure that out? And I go, well, you know, I went and talked to a stone carver. <laughs> I went and worked in a butcher shop. I was washing dishes, and I studied the reflections of things when food dripped on them and stuff. I looked at forks and knives and dishes. So... Yeah, you can imagine, you can look at references. We have the internet now, which is great, of course. You say, I want to know what metal, shiny metal looks like that's shaped like an ellipse. You can find that in the internet in two seconds. But, if you want to have some of the vagaries of uh, creation, you know, if you want to still be... your own original person, you're going to have to study. And, uh, you know, there's artists that are very successful making a living. I don't, I don't make a living with my art, you know, with digital art. Um, because, number one, I don't repeat what I do. I haven't tried to make something cute that everybody buys. It's just not me. You know, other artists do those things. And they're very successful at it. And I don't want to copy them. I don't want my art to look like theirs. I want to do my thing until I find that happy medium where it's just awesome. And... Yeah, see, so now I'm looking at all that scraping, and I just go, I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't, I hate it. So I'm going to undo it. Oh! I didn't mean to hit that. Uh, let me go back to this persona. I want to export. Undo, undo, undo. Get rid of all that. There we go. Undo, undo. Fresh start. Undo. Yeah. That's another wonderful thing about this. If you're working traditionally and you scraped away or you applied paint, you know, sometimes I'm scraping it off with a knife if it's cardboard or I'm a mixed media guy. Uh, there's no undo. You know, you did it and now you're stuck with it. And then you got to either start over, make a patch. There's a lot of ways to fix things, mixed media, art. There's a lot of ways to, to do that stuff. But digitally, you have the power to see if I put that white line in there and I didn't like that, I can just say edit, undo, and it is undone. It's gone. So when I pick these lines again, I have to change the opacity. So now we're going to get into airbrush. We go back to airbrush. Babbling. 
what I call airbrush. I have certain brushes I use. Oh, boy, there we go. You know, I'm trying to get away from the harsh, but now I want to keep the geometry in this piece where this links together in a, a zigzag shape like a maze. Again, another peculiar thing, you can find tribes in the jungle that draw perfect geometric mazes on their face and tattoo them in there. And their lines are only as thick as, uh, say, a fat 32nd of an inch or something. And they're beautiful. And uh, why they put a maze on their face again means they saw something now they do take very heavy drugs you know ayahuasca and mushrooms and poisons from frogs you lick a frog and you can uh, have an hallucinogenic trip and that same poison in intense amounts kills a monkey on the end of your dart so they do things that we don't do ourselves anymore and have dreams and have trips but uh, some things when you see them knowing a jungle doesn't have any mazes and linear lines that fall naturally like that straight lines everything is you know broken curves and jagged lines and parts of jungles trees that are fallen and they grow straight but they're crooked and all that uh, you know Things rise up out of the canopy, mushrooms grow on the floor, and other plants go around, and things are medicinal, and so on. But when you draw a maze on your face, maybe you saw circuitry. You know, maybe you were in a, in a ship. Maybe you saw the bottom of a craft. They had to see something, because human beings, they're human, the, the natives right like us they have different cultures they've been around a long time there you know we're new like i'm born into a city i've been in the city as many years as i've been alive and prior to that i know nothing about the world so they're in a jungle they know nothing about new york you know that's their frame of reference and when i see what they do it tells me what they saw because as an artist we're kind of observant that way. And if you're the one person watching this video, I want to thank you for putting in all this time, even if you skipped along the timeline to get here. Kudos to you for supporting me a little bit. I appreciate it much. I do put a lot of work into my stuff, an immense amount of work. And I'm proud of it, and I, you know, I'm happy with it. And I'm evolving as an artist in my own mind. But just so you can see into the mind, the reason I make these videos is to leave a legacy, even if I don't get famous, to leave a legacy that others may find one day and understand how we thought as humans, how we wished we could understand our history, our legacy, why we're here, how we made it through the six extinctions, who took care of us, who nurtured us, who created us. If you look at how you make a car, you would never say, oh yeah, that car, it just happened. <laughs> Same thing with human beings, I assure you. There are clues in our DNA that when we study them, we go, there's just no way you could get a voice box in that short span of time through natural selection. It was introduced 100,000 years ago by another civilization into our DNA or something like that, okay? So, of course, if you're this far into it, you're going to be a person that seeks to study things the same way I do. That has a curiosity that's willing to put in the time and the effort. And 
is really not here to say that this guy's crazy. Let's lock him up. You're saying, how does he do what he does? And that will give me a starting point to do what I do. And when you do that, you have a history that understands the use of a tool, the method, why the person used the tool the way that they did. And you can say, well, now that I know how that tool works, what its potential is, I would like to use that tool too, but I have a better idea for my creation. Or a different idea. You know, I'm going to use a hinge joint. I'm going to not pound a nail in. I think I can join these two pieces without glue. Um, and that's, you know, here's an example too. We are what we consider to be the most advanced human beings ever to be on the planet Earth. And yet, with metallurgy, all our sciences, and all our skills, even though we could chop up an ancient Japanese sword and decipher the materials in it, we cannot create one. We cannot make it the way they made it. Make copies, and you can use a forge, and you can have a guy 100 years old sitting there puffing on the wood and all that stuff, and he makes one. And it's sharp, and it's strong, but it's not like the ancient ones. Because I studied those. I was a martial artist. And let me tell you, the way they got iron, they put a handkerchief in their mouth because they didn't want to breathe on the materials. They believed that the sword had a spirit. And why they believed that is they saw something else happen, the original makers of the swords. So they put a handkerchief in their mouth, and they took a magnet, and they dragged it through sand. And that metal that you pick up is called lodestone. It's pure iron. And when you collect enough of that into a, a pile, you combine it with other things to make metal when you heat it with fire and then fold it and fold it and fold it. And um, based on the number of folds, you know, start with one, you fold it, now you have two. You start with that, you fold it, you get a four. You fold that, you get a Eight, you fold that, you got 16. When they're done folding uh, the blade of a sword, there's 32,000 folds. <laughs> How is it they knew 32,000? You know, those many folds was right. They had help. It isn't just like you're going to sit down and in one century, 100 years, you're going to figure this out because... We can't make one. I don't, I don't know how to tell you that anymore, but we cannot make one. Which means, even given all the time that we have now, since World War II, since 1945 when it ended, till now, we cannot duplicate a Japanese sword in the manner that they made them at the time they were using them for weapons. And when you think about the scale, that every man had to have one of these swords. How did they make them all? <laughs> you know, they're time consuming. They're really time consuming. You know, where are all these forges? People just, they don't think about this stuff because it's mind blowing. It's staggeringly mind blowing. Say you had. A hundred thousand guys that were fighting, and you needed a hundred thousand swords. You know, a guy that makes them now maybe turns out three swords in a year. So, I'm confusing you with the facts. I'm going to take this to one and a half hours to scan. You're watching me develop this. Because uh, this is one of the ones that have drawn me in. So I'm going to be working on this for quite a while. And that will lead me to discoveries. Ah, yes. 
it's a multiverse also so that when this hand appears it's not just in one dimension it's not just in the three-dimensional world it's in another world it's in the fourth dimension it might be in the fifth dimension as well as our dimension and that creates another level of confusion because something is here and it's there and it's missing but it's not <laughs> you know hard to describe hard to describe yeah. I do these without my face because there's just too much to, th you know, when you're thinking about your face, you're just not trying, you're just thinking about how I look on a camera and I don't know it's stupid and get to have it at the right angle and that's another thing to completely think about. And some people do that really well. <laughs> Marla Maple or whatever her name is, she's awesome. <laughs> People that are making a successful amount of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars off of Google and YouTube. My hat goes off to those people. I am not intelligent enough to do that. Can't find a partnership with somebody. You know? If I could could be rich, both of us. It's so nice to have a female partner that did that. A lot of those are husband and wife things. And because there's a girl involved, people tune in, or, you know, if they're rappers, there's going to be that thing going on. But, but for me, there's a... See, now I've got really shiny metal. I've got some springs. I've got some coils. I've got some stamped parts and I have confusion of the atmosphere around it mm. being part of it mm. let's uh, move back from this now make sure we say that we did so we're gonna go uh, view and First, I like to look at it at actual size. So let's move this around with the hand. That's at the maximum output. Then I go view to fit. Uh, so we can do that. See the whole image. See now how nice and detailed that thumb is. And it can be lit. All of this can be lit from a certain angle and stuff. But there's the first kind of spring metal stuff it's starting to be articulated and solid and have gravity and mass and volume so I'm really digging that you can view this uh, say let me go to zoom zoom to fit so we did that but if you do width it's gonna go uh, as tall as it can go like that and still keep the width uh, within the frame so it can move that up see like that you can uh, this is affinity designer so you can um, you can do uh, what we don't want to do like 200 and 300 and 400 because it's gigantic. We can do pixel size. It's like, what? You can do, uh, yeah, zoom in. You can do zoom out, of course, zoom to fit. And play with all those things. So if you were doing something small, you might want to take it up to 800%. Like, say you want to work on this eye. So I might say, view. 200% and then find the eye just somewhere in this drawing right there okay so there's that eye 
and all these textures and then if I was going to articulate that with some hard lines and stuff like that I could do that and I could scale back I could say 100% see now that's how he looks the monkey kind of face there with the smirk and then I could say uh, ooh, let's see instead of 100% we should there should be stuff like 50% which would be great um, so zoom to width very cool and then we move this around again back to the metal so thanks for tuning in I'm going to uh, make sure I save this save as I gotta be anal about this or it'll get lost perfect I'm going to stop this video and that'll be something that I process do 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 and post in the next day or two so